Good evening, everyone. I'm happy to have people joining our webinar on the containment strategies for COVID-19 in Taiwan. Um, we have a little technical problem, as you might hear, there is a little echo in the room, but hopefully we will still be able to hold our webinar and I would less, just like to explain the rules a little bit. Um, everyone is muted by default, and but there is still the probability to um, give questions to the ambassador and also to Reinhard and myself. You can write a question in the question box or you can raise your hand and then we would take, um, take the, take the um, contributions um, in a mostly fair manner, I hope. So, but I am very glad that the Honorable Harry Tseng has agreed to join us today and especially I'm very glad that the wonderful Reinhard Bütikofer has made it possible to hold this webinar and I'll give over to him. Reinhard, go ahead. Well, thanks for the wonderful well, Utah Paulus also. Uh, I'm very happy, um, very happy Dr. Um, Harry Tsung, Dr. that you are with us tonight to give us uh, your presentation. We um, value that very much. I just shortly want to introduce you. Um, Dr. Tsung was educated at Two, uh, two universities in Taiwan, in Taiwan, in Princeton, and did his PhD at the University of Virginia. He had a long and distinguished career in the um, foreign policy ministry of the uh, of Taiwan. So he was the deputy uh, director of the Taiwan. Economic and Cultural Representative Office in the U.S., uh, the uh, Taipei Economic Cultural Representative Office in the U.S. Director, uh, Director General in the Department of North American Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Representative in Ireland, Ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan, to the Republic of Palau, that was was one of the countries that had diplomatic relations with um, Taiwan. And his latest two functions were Deputy, Deputy Secretary General to the uh, President's Office and Deputy Secretary General to the National Security Council in Taipei. And now he has been representing um, uh, uh, Taiwan in one in Brussels to the EU and to Belgium, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, welcome again, again, Dr. Tsung. Uh, we're happy to um, uh, to find you willing to to share with with us the experience in your country. So please give us an overview, and we will follow up with Q and A after that. You have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Paulus and Mr. Budikofer for your invitation. I'm really happy uh, to have this opportunity to share with you and the audience online the experience we have in Taiwan in fighting uh, the pandemic. Uh, as of today, we have 427 cases and the six deaths, and among which 253 were cured. By that, I mean that uh, they were hospitalized and treated and now tested negative three times in a row to be considered cured and put out of quarantine. And among the confirmed cases, 427, only 55 uh, were locally transmitted and 10, only 10, of the 55, uh, we are not able to trace its infection source. So by definition, we still don't have a community transmission 
in Taiwan yet. Of course, having said that, uh, there is something happened only four days ago when we have a, a kind of a cluster infection on board of a naval ship. Uh, this naval ship was on a foreign mission. It came back uh, to uh, have contracted 29 of uh, the 744 sailors. And now this is a critical period for us to see how uh, much implication this is going to generate. Uh, so uh, for the next uh, 10 days, uh, if we are able to keep uh, the uh, increase of the new cases uh, very low, then we will consider that we also safeguarded uh, this uh, new challenge. So uh, what happened in Taiwan and how did we handle our challenges? And here's uh, what I'm going to explain to you. Uh, first of all, I must emphasize that uh, people in Taiwan still remember a lot of what happened 17 years ago when SARS uh, hit Taiwan very hard. Uh, 17 years ago in 2003, we have 73 deaths and more than 10,000 cases. And uh, many people still keep a traumatic memory of that time. Of course, since 2003, we also suffered H1N1 avian flu and H7N9 avian flu, both of which originated in China. And now we have COVID-19. And um, so China has been the epicenter of different epidemic in the past. It only makes sense for our people always to keep very high uh, vigilance to uh, whatever coming out of China. And under this background, uh, our Taiwan CDC people, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC people, uh, are always on very high alert, as I explained. And in December last year, we started to hear different rumors coming out of China, and so much so that on 31st of December, uh, uh, Taiwan CDC sent an email to the WHO. Uh, we described uh, what we heard on this email and then uh, ask for the WHO to, sub to give us more information. Of course, this email has become very famous. It was reported in the mainstream international media, including uh, Financial Times. I cannot delve into the details of this email now, but if you are interested or audience online are interested, uh, you are welcome to come back to this point in the Q&A. So uh, on the 31st of December, when we sent out uh, the email to the WHO, there are two other things our government did on the same day. The first one is the government alerted our people that there is an unknown, uh, mysterious uh, pneumonia outbreak in China. And the government urged our people to take precautions. And number two, our health officials uh, started to board planes uh, flying in from Wuhan to board and inspect, to board and screen the passengers for those who have fever. And then, um, of course, uh, we have started very early, and this is something uh, that makes Taiwan a, a little bit different from the other countries. We didn't get any reply from the WHO. Uh, the response from the WHO for our email is only a very brief acknowledgement of receipt and no further details. So six days later on the 6th of January, we sent an urgent request to visit Wuhan. We want to take a look and to find out more. We didn't get a reply from China again to say yes, until five days later, on the 11th of January, which was Saturday, and which also happens to be our presidential election day. Most people in Taiwan on the 11th of January would be following the proceedings of our election very closely. They could have missed the incoming mayors, but uh, given the importance of this matter, uh, our CDC people uh, picked up this incoming mayor on the same day um, it came in 
uh, in the late afternoon, as I was told. And then very quickly, we managed to send two epidemiologists to Wuhan the next day, Sunday, 12th of January. Of course, they arrived in Wuhan the same day on Sunday evening, and then the following few days when they were in Wuhan, they have some uh, interesting findings. Uh, the first finding is, uh, according to their observation, the situation was already very severe uh, in Wuhan. The situation in the hospital was even worse. They were not given access to talk to the frontline doctors and nurses, but uh, they heard discussions in the hospital about a possible isolation of the entire city of Wuhan. And they also found that much of the attention of their frontline doctors and nurses were given to the hospitalized severe cases, severe patients. When our expert asked them about uh, the patients with minor symptoms and ask about uh, trace contact of those people, we didn't get a clear answer. This actually uh, proves to be a very important finding because when we started to have our own case in Taiwan, uh, we made special effort to do the trace, con the contact tracing because we thought, we believe in our view that if the contact tracing was practiced as early as that in the early uh, in the middle of uh, January, it could have stopped the further spread of the coronavirus in Wuhan. It might well be con con contained in an area um, much less uh, spacious, much less wide as wide as uh, what we see today. Well, that is the sixth of June. And then after that, uh, not until the 20th, not until the 20th of January, did we see uh, China's leader, Xi Jinping, came out to publicly mention there's epidemic. And the same day, the leading epidemiologist from China, uh, Mr. Zhong Nansan, also for the first time publicly admitted that this uh, coronavirus uh, can be transmitted among human. Our immediate response in Taiwan is to set up the epidemic command center on the same day, 20th of January. Well, uh, this command center was actually established in 2004, a year after the SARS epidemic. But uh, in a usual time, uh, this command center uh, will not be operational until when there is a crisis like what we have this time, it can be reactivated very quickly. And then uh, on the 24th of January, one day after the lockdown of Wuhan, Wuhan was locked down on the 23rd, only three days after China Chinese officials make it public to their people. Mm. On the 24th, our government laid down a, a directive mm, to stop the export of our masks uh, to conserve the supplies for our local demand. Mm. This is a precaution that was taken so early and so aggressive that uh, proved to be a very wise move. It wasn't popular when this directive was laid down by the government, but it proved a very wise move. And in addition, we heard that there were orders coming from China trying to buy out uh, the masks in the market. Uh, if we haven't stopped the export of the, market, uh, the, the masks at that time, we could have faced a very uh, serious shot of the masks uh, later on. So um, that was what happened on the 24th of January. Six days later, our government took another uh, very uh, aggressive precaution. Uh, on the 30th of January, our government took one step further uh, to ask the mask factories in Taiwan to supply all their products exclusively to our government 
so that our health authorities can send these masks to the local drug stores in order to meet the people's demand. And uh, on the 30th of January, there was also one very important thing, very important development. Uh, that is, um, the WHO declared this coronavirus as a public health emergency uh, of international concern, PHEIC. Uh, by the way, uh, after China made it public on the 20th, uh, there were two emergency meetings held by the WHO. The first one was on the 22nd of January. The second one was what I said, the 30th of January. Taiwan was the only country with infected cases not invited to this discussion. Uh, anyhow, a PHEIC was declared after the emergency meeting in the WHO on the 30th of January. And unfortunately, there was no uh, introduction of travel alert following this PHEIC. And so, uh, we waited for a few days. On the 6th of February, we decided to cross our borders to the Chinese nationals because the situation in China, what we heard, what they started to report uh, to the WHO uh, seemed to be very uh, serious. It's not going to stop. It's, it's increasing in a very, uh, uh, very appalling way. We crossed the border to the Chinese nationals on the 6th of February. And at the same time, for people coming in from Hong Kong and Macau, they are required uh, to uh, go through a mandatory uh, quarantine of 14 days. Uh, the same day on the 6th of February, our government decided to take another precaution. That is to begin rationing the masks so that uh, it can give our people equal access in order to prevent a panic buying and uh, prevent a stocking up of masks. And this also uh, is considered a very wise move later on. Uh, that was the 6th of February when so much uh, measures was taken by the government. I want to add uh, for your understanding that uh, our Ministry of uh, Economic Affairs, uh, they, they brought together the machine tool makers, the mask producers, and the material manufacturers together in order uh, to uh, expand the production capability of our masks. Mm. Uh, so in late January, our daily uh, pro production capability uh, was only 1.8 million pieces a day. Uh, in early April, only 40 days later, we brought up our production capability to 13 million pieces of masks per day. That is the reason why we are able to uh, supply to our domestic uh, demand. And at the same time, uh, when we are still pushing up our production capability, we have we are afford uh, to share uh, some of our masks abroad. Mm. Uh, I am going on very slowly, so I can see that my 20 minutes of time of presentation seems to be up. But I want to add something here on the 7th of February. This is a very important date because uh, the doctor, the Wuhan doctor, uh, Mr. Di Wenliang, um, who is the whistleblower um, and was faced to sign a confession uh, in, on which he was accused of uh, spreading a false statement. He passed away on the 7th of February. And uh, there was an in point in, in, inflow, the point in of the, uh, the condolences online uh, from uh, many corners in China. Uh, I think, uh, I, I must um, make a reference to Dr. Li Wenliang just to show uh, uh, a respect to him. Anyway, this situation continued in February until uh, in, uh, into March, when China considered that uh, their situation has largely uh, uh, calmed down. 
mitigated. So on the 10th of uh, March, uh, Xi Jinping visited Wuhan for the first time since the outbreak uh, as an indication to their people that uh, China is ready to move uh, to uh, a more normal, no, normal life. Uh, but uh, very ironically, uh, one day later, 11th of March, the WHO declared this coronavirus as a pandemic. <laughs> so it was only after she's visit to Wuhan when the uh, WHO declared it a pandemic. And for Taiwan, this is also a very important demarcation line because from early uh, January to the middle of March, we only accumulated no more than 50 cases and only one death. It seems that we are doing a very good job when we are concentrating on the challenges coming from China. But starting from uh, the early and then the middle of March, when the new case is picking up in Taiwan in uh, almost a double digit every day, we were less well uh, prepared because this time the new cases uh, coming in from Europe, North America, and Middle East. Uh, you know, to a certain extent, it was to our surprise and it came in so quickly and so, uh, so seriously. So much so that our government uh, was forced to cross our border uh, to the foreign nationals on the 19th of March, and all the re returning Taiwanese uh, since the 19th of March are required to go through a 14-day quarantine. So um, this is pretty much where we are now, even though I mentioned in the beginning that we have a naval ship on, on which uh, there is a kind of a cluster inflection, uh, infection of uh, 29 sailors. Um, from these 29 sailors, we trace back uh, to uh, the, a very big number of people, uh, whom some of whom we ask uh, to go through the self-quarantine. Some of them, uh, we ask them to do a self-monitoring of their health condition. There were uh, 200,000 uh, people uh, using our AIs and using the GPS uh, location uh, searching uh, to to be identified from these 29 cases uh, infected uh, on board of the naval ship. So uh, let me stop here, and then uh, I pretty much go through uh, chronologically what happened in Taiwan, and at the same time I introduce uh, the different measures laid down by our government. I hope that uh, would be uh, uh, a very basic information for you. Uh, to absorb, and then uh, I would welcome uh, questions from uh, the audience, and including the two MCs. Thank you, Dr. Zhang, um, for this presentation. Uh, maybe I, I would want to ask you a first question myself, and the question would be, if you look at the whole panorama of what you did at different moments in crisis management. And of course, as you implied, you never know whether you're really safe until you've passed the pandemic. Uh, but, but so far, you've been doing very well in Taiwan. What have been the two or three most important elements of the strategy that was applied by your government to facilitate such a um, effective, basically, reining in of the risk? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I think uh, the education of our people to use, to wear masks as often as possible is a very important uh, factor uh, in our uh, good achievement uh, fighting this pandemic. Of course, it's, it's not something unusual for our people to wear masks, uh, but this is a crisis 
this is a hard time. So for people to do this uh, even more diligently than they used to uh, is something very important. This is why I spent uh, some time to uh, tell you uh, the policies that our government imposed on this uh, aspect. So by uh, stopping the export of masks and then by uh, increasing the ex ex expansion of the production of the masks, those are all very important in our fight with mm -hmm. this epidemic. And the second thing I think very important and we are very proud and we are willing to share with countries who uh, would need this is the application of the AI, uh, artificial intelligence. And as you know, we have a digital minister, uh, Audrey Tang. And while different ministries are doing their own work, uh, our digital minister Tang, uh, he worked with our local uh, talents uh, from the, uh, the technology industry to uh, create digital tools to help our people and help our government to fight this uh, pandemic. So um, he created something that can incorporate uh, big data uh, and our people's uh, health ID card and to allow uh, even distribution of uh, masks. He, uh, she often, uh, she also worked with the programmers uh, to create an app that can track uh, the inventories of uh, the masks in a local drugstore uh, near the users. Mm. Um, she helped the uh, National Health Insurance uh, uh, website and improved uh, this website and its app to allow our people to buy masks online mm. and then, then okay. pick them up uh, in a convenience store nearby. Now, uh, on the one hand, we have a, a command center that is holding a live stream uh, briefings to our people every day, mm -hmm. explaining to our people what happened in the past 24 hours. On the other hand, we also have ministers uh, working closely with the private sector, uh, putting the convenience of people at the first place, making it as easy as possible for our people to have access to uh, masks. So uh, in return, our people, in order to show their appreciation, they work with the government. That is very important because this is a battle that requires a cooperation, a very close partnership between the government and the people to guarantee that we can safeguard uh, our public health. So uh, basically is the use of masks and then the uh, application of AI that I think uh, play a very important role in our battle with mm -hmm. the pandemic. Thank you. It, what you just said reminds me of the conversation that Jutta Paulus and I had with the ambassador of uh, uh, the Republic of Korea. And he also emphasized uh, two of the elements that you mentioned, namely uh, wearing masks, and he also explained to us that in his country, uh, people are accustomed to doing that and it's not a, a, a challenge for them. And he also mentioned AI, but he also mentioned a third pillar in the South Korean approach, which is heavy testing. So maybe you would want to say a word about that too? Well, Testing uh, certainly is very important because it's the first step uh, to identify uh, the cases. Uh, different from the other countries, uh, we in Taiwan, we do not practice mass testing. Uh, it is somehow not necessary for Taiwan to do mass testing for the reason that our cases build up very slowly. From January to mid-March, we only have 50 cases. So the way we do the testing is by uh, contact tracing, especially cross-contact tracing. So once we have confirmed cases, we trace back from this person. Very often from one case, we can trace back to more than 100, sometimes 150 uh, possible uh, suspicious cases. And then we test those targeted uh, 
people. And that bring down a lot of uh, the testing, the number of the tests. This is the reason why uh, we don't want to give up our strategy of containment and our strategy of close contact tracing. Because uh, if you are looking at uh, massive uh, mass uh, testing, it is only when you have a community transmission and you have so many cases at one time that um, it becomes even uh, almost impossible for you to do individual contact tracing. I hope that kind of situation uh, wouldn't become the reality in Taiwan. Yes, it was a rea reality in Korea. I think that's that's one of the reasons why they they had to do it that way because they had this one super spreading event where a person who was infected went to a, a religious event and she contacted more than 1,000 people, and so that was really their point zero, so to speak, um, before they they had only very few cases too. Um, as to the proceedings, I have two written questions which came to my office via mail earlier this day. Um, we have two oral questions and other written questions which have just come in during the webinar. I would propose that we do the two questions which came via mail first and then do some of the written questions and then I would um, give the floor to the now no, three, one, two, two. Right now it's two people who have raised their hands. So the written question to you, Dr. Tseng, would be um, that the policy decisions of WHO have been criticized and you have given a very a very good history of why this is probably right to, to criticize these decisions. Do you think that the outcome of this pandemic worldwide would have been different if the WHO had reacted immediately? Well, my, uh, yes, my answer would be a very clear cut yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, uh, I think- That uh, was quick. When dealing with a pandemic uh, or epidemic of any kind, a very rapid response is uh, most fundamental. Uh, when you let it go on for a while without your attention, it simply uh, will become uncontrollable, unpreventable. Mm -hmm. This is the nature of the virus because this is an, an invisible enemy that we are dealing with. And then you have to uh, control uh, those numbers that is just coming up. So um, case number one is very important. For Taiwan, our uh, first uh, reported case uh, was in 21st of January. And we started from this case uh, to do the contact tracing and to, to require the quarantines, everything. Uh, there is a like a textbook approach as an SOP for us to do this. Now, uh, if the WHO uh, has alerted uh, the people of different countries in the world that uh, this is a, a tremendous dangerous uh, virus that we are dealing with and uh, countries in the world should take up uh, precautions as early as possible. And mm -hmm. even better, they can advise people what to do, uh, then uh, the situation would be very different. Thank you. And the second question is actually going towards my colleague Reinhardt. Um, and it's virtually the same question as has been just um, written down in the, in the webinar. In the light of the lessons learned, what would be your recommendation to the EU concerning Taiwan's observer status in international organizations and United Nations agencies? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um... I think we should stick to um, the topic that we have chosen for this uh, webinar, which is uh, the present coronavirus crisis. And in this context, the United Nations organization that is relevant is the WHO. And I can uh, report that together with a number of colleagues, uh, from the European Parliament, I have just sent a letter to HRVP Boe uh, asking uh, that uh, the EU should emphasize the need to include Taiwan fully 
uh, into the work of the WHO on a very pragmatic basis. In the past, Taiwan had been allowed at times to be an observer to the WHO. That has not, that practice has been discontinued, uh, in particular because of the influence from Beijing. Now, I don't want to step into the minefield of um, discussing the status of Taiwan and everything. I just want to be pragmatic and say Taiwan is a country with a well-renowned health system. Taiwan has proven that it can contribute. It has a lot of experience. It has been effective in fighting the crisis. So Taiwan should be included fully in all practical dimensions. Whether that be as an observer or whatever the status is, should not sit at the center of this conversation for the time being. We have a lot of time to sort out these uh, status related issues, but we want to bring everybody on board to help fighting together against the crisis. This is my attitude at this moment. Thank you very much. We appreciate that effort. Um, I have okay. seen a couple of questions, Yuta. Uh, maybe you have others, or should I read a few of no, the questions go ahead. that go have ahead. come in? Um, uh, there are some uh, some political questions um, uh, that um, um, one one practical question is uh, regarding the masks. Um, somebody from Berlin writes: Are you convinced that the masks protect from the virus? Our experts think they cannot protect from the virus. And a second practical question also from Berlin is, did the Taiwan government also involve the civil society organizations to fight the pandemic? Well, uh, the efficacy of uh, wearing masks, um, I think is, is kind of demonstrated in Taiwan. Uh, also by some Asian countries. Uh, the quality of the masks, of course, is very important. What I'm talking about here is a, a surgical masks, or uh, even better quality would be N95. Uh, I'm not talking about a different kind of uh, masks. Uh, I, uh, we have seen different research uh, having different results but there seems to always uh, indicated that uh, the masks will certainly help you uh, to uh, protect yourself uh, from others and also uh, protect others from you if you because you don't know if you are a asymptomatic uh, carrier so it is a mutual protocol uh, for people to do this and this is already uh, a, a way to show you you're being considerate to other people is part of the courtesy now that you have to do in Taiwan. And um, another thing uh, good about wearing masks to me, I think it is not only the mask itself that is protecting you. When you have something on your face, it is one way to remind you that uh, uh, you have to be very cautious because you are wearing something that can be uncomfortable, but you are willing to bear with it. So uh, come along with it would be, you would alert yourself of uh, you know, a better hygiene habit. You would alert yourself to uh, do hand washing more frequently. Without wearing masks, you will, may not be reminded of doing this on a regular basis or on a very frequent basis. So the mask itself uh, has its efficacy and there is also something a side effect which is positive to bring along with it. As for um, your, your, your second question is about the civil society in Taiwan, uh, how are they helping our government to do this? Uh, to be honest, this pandemic business 
is highly professional. Uh, it requires expertise to do that. So our people uh, trust uh, the uh, the central command and those people who know who who know what they are talking about and who lay down very sensible measures for us to follow. And then um, the people, as uh, the civil society in Taiwan, I think they are helping in a different way. They are not asking. Uh, 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 suggesting a different approach uh, to do better uh, precaution. Not necessary that, I didn't see too much of that, but I saw a lot of NGOs in Taiwan voluntarily trying to come up with their uh, programs to send assistance abroad or send yeah. assistance to people uh, who need that at home. And these are very good because it is a, a, a kind of a community, community spirit and um, now these civil societies, they may not uh, have the expertise uh, to give advice to, uh, uh, in terms of how to prevent uh, the coronavirus from attacking you, but uh, they are helping us to do humanitarian assistance. That is really good to see. Thank you. Somebody uh, wrote a question, uh, Dr. Tsung, that says, you spoke about a whistleblower who passed away on the 7th of February. Was he killed or was it a natural death? I think you spoke about Dr. Lee Wen Leung, who was infected by the virus fighting against uh, the epidemic, and then he died of that, right? That was... Yes. Okay. Uh, then there's so another qu question. Uh, um, my question... I, had, I would, yeah. I would just very briefly step in on, on the mask issue and the protection because I did read quite a lot on that. Um, it really does depend on the material that the mask is made of, um, the grade of protection, but um, any material does protect at to a certain grade, of course. And there are the PPE masks, which are worn by medical personnel. They protect the wearer, but they do not protect at all the surroundings because they usually have a ventile where you blow out the air you couldn't you because if you would blow against the mask it would lift off your face but um, those community masks are also the surgical masks they prevent the little droplets that come from your mouth even when we breathe when we speak these will be held in the mask which is why it is so important not just to wear the same mask over and over again and um taiwan is in the good situation of being able to deploy sufficient masks to their people um to the population which we have not so a lot of us will wear um we call them community masks they are just soon from cotton or whatever, and you can sterilize them using, for example, a hot iron or putting them in into the, the oven, um, which is sufficient for killing off the virus, of course, but they're not meant as protective gear in the same fashion as the PPA masks for, for a medical personnel. Um, so, Reinhard, I would very much like to give Sabine the floor, who has been raising her hand for, I don't know, half an hour now. Sabina, I'm unmuting you. You have to unmute yourself too, please. Oh, my apologies. Yes. I didn't raise my hand, maybe only accidentally, but it's oh, okay. nice to see you and thank you very much for the wonderful event. Thank you so much. Okay, then I'll put your hand on. <laughs> okay, I have a question here that goes uh, to the ambassador. My question to Ambassador is concerning the signals from which Taiwan government interpreted very early that the situation in the mainland is out of the ordinary. Given how opaque and contradictory Beijing sometimes communicates, could you share some of your, with some of your European friends what the most important red flags were that were reasons to be worried for you? Well, uh, as I said, uh, there is a there is a historical record that um, different epidemics originated in China coming our way. Uh, so it only makes sense for our uh, public health officials 
paying constant attention to China. And this time is actually not much different in that sense, especially when a rumor can reach to our attention. It probably is a rumor uh, circulating in the social media for a while. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the next day that we pick it up. And so when we heard that and not see much done uh, from the Chinese uh, officials or the health authorities, it really, uh, it really worries us. Uh, if I can come back to that uh, warning email that we sent out on the 31st of December, it was actually a very simple email. We, we alerted the WHO to, to say that uh, there are at least seven cases of atypical pneumonia. And um, these uh, seven cases uh, were in Wuhan. Uh, the specimen of uh, the uh, patients have been sent uh, for examination and waiting for the result. We were told it is not SARS, but these are the people who are under isolation treatment. Uh, in this email, which is very short, um, the WHO Director General, uh, Dr. Tichero, he said that Taiwan didn't say clearly that there is a human-to-human -human transmission in this email. And, and that, uh, I don't know if, does he mean that because we didn't say that, so he didn't pass his arm or he didn't uh, do anything uh, uh, concerning our, our warning. But uh, if we are laymen, if we are talking to each other, we know that this uh, letter indeed didn't have that sentence, human to human transmission. But when this letter is uh, circulating among the experts, they are not laymen, they are doctors, uh, they are uh, public health uh, experts. When you see that these patients were put under isolation treatment and back in 2003, uh, when we were hard hit by SARS, actually atypical pneumonia is the way we call SARS before it was called SARS. So uh, SARS, uh, how serious SARS met uh, to the world uh, back in uh, 17 years ago was a well-known fact now. So uh, to say that we didn't say it human to human transmission in the email, and this is the reason they didn't deal with it, simply is a very lame excuse to me. And to, uh, to add to that, back in 31st of December, we didn't have any case in Taiwan. We only heard about it from the social media. And we bring that to the attention of the WHO. There is no ground for us to say that this is human transmissionable because we don't have our own case yet. We only want the WHO to look into it and then perhaps uh, to examine uh, the fact to a greater uh, extent. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. But if I may also say something about Dr. Li Wenliang for uh, the online audience who uh, do not notice well. Dr. Li, uh, he sent out a warning among a small community of his close friends on the 30th of December. He was, among, he was one of a few uh, doctors uh, who saw the cases as a very uh, mysterious pneumonia that they haven't seen before and alerting each other. But three days later, uh, some people say it's the 2nd or the 3rd of January, he was visited by the uh, national security office, officials and he was forced to sign a confession to admit that he uh, was spreading a false statement. It was very unfortunate. He was one of the eight doctors who were penalized by the national security uh, officials, but he was the only one who died of this uh, this disease on the 7th of February. I have quite a variety of different questions and I'm not sure we can cover them all because we have about 10 minutes left. So I will try to put together a list of them for you, um, Dr. Tsung, that you maybe respond to a few of the questions in one, one fell swoop. So one uh, question from my friend Fraser is, to what extent was there or is there cooperation between Taiwan and its immediate neighbors on the crisis? 
cooperation between Taiwan and neighbors. One question. Another question is, um, how does tracking with technology actually work? What kind of data are you collecting and how is data privacy acknowledged? Um, then another question to you, and I will ask you two more. Please take note if you can. Um, what does Taiwan think about the official case number published by China? And uh, a third question, uh, a fourth question um, uh, goes to the uh, MEPs, to you to myself, and we will answer that, um, that in the end. And then there was uh, one more question for you, um, Dr. Tsung. Um, it, it is from an Italian participant, and the question reads, in a recent poll, 52% of Italians think China is a friendly country because as first nation, Beijing sent millions of face masks to Italy. Um, Chinese, um, China, how much influence do you think China will have in Italy and in other EU member states after the emergency and during the economic crisis Europe will face? So quite different questions, but maybe you can cover uh, them all. Thank you very much. Uh, to the first question by Fraser, um, nice to know that you are uh, among the audience. Uh, the extent of the cooperation we have with our neighboring countries. Well, uh, if you are talking about neighboring countries uh, like uh, the Philippines, Japan, or South Korea, uh, actually not much that I know of. We are all busy uh, dealing with our own challenge because all the breakouts, uh, outbreaks uh, in the uh, in that part of the world seems to happen more or less the same time. We are all hands full dealing with our own problems, but there are cooperations between Taiwan and the EU, the Taiwan and the United States, especially on the development of uh, a vaccine or on the development of a rapid testing kit. We think that a rapid diagnostic is very important for us, especially when we are going to go into the post-COVID-19 uh, era, then uh, it may come back as, you know, this is the nature of this uh, the virus. So we need to have that kind of rapid uh, diagnostics. We are, uh, we have very capable uh, labs, uh, Academia Sinica included, they are working with the EU uh, in order to share the result of our research, we are doing this with the United States as well. And of course, uh, at a later stage, when we are more able uh, to share uh, with uh, the countries in the world that need masks, we send it out. That is what we did. Uh, the, how uh, do we do uh, contact tracing and uh, does, does it the concerns is the GDPR? Well, uh, the contact tracing in Taiwan uh, is imposed for those who are under quarantine. When I say quarantine, it's either home quarantine or quarantine in a facility given by the government, designated by the government. When you are uh, hospitalized, now um, you are uh, constantly under the watch of the medical teams. So, um, and then I said uh, earlier that uh, we only uh, testing, we only test uh, a very targeted group of people and so uh, it's not the mass testing. So uh, two very important principles when we do the contact tracing. One is it has to be warrant, warrant, voluntary. Those people who must agree to this testing, those uh, are in home uh, quarantine, uh, they know that they are doing this uh, uh, at the expense of their personal experience, but for the better good of the society. And they are willing to do this, they're willing to cooperate with our government. And the second very important principle is it has to be temporary. Uh, there is only 14 days for a quarantine. Then after these 14 days, you no longer trace uh, their uh, uh, trace them any longer. And then, so upon this uh, principle of uh, volunteer and the temporary, I think uh, the contact tracing has to become a consensus of the people. As I said, they have to work with the government if we want to win the battle together. Also, the third question about the number uh, official figure uh, released by the Chinese government, uh, I must say that uh, I, uh, 
I take it with a grain of salt, and it's, it's a very big grain. Um, it, it is simply not logical. It simply doesn't add uh, to the fact. Uh, when you see so many countries with that kind of uh, fertility ratio and so low in China, and then this 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 is a very I don't want to really use this, but I believe there is a cover up uh, very early in uh, the outbreak, and uh, let, let me put it let me leave it at that. And the Italian uh, the listeners question about uh, more than 50% of the Italian population consider China as a friendly country. That is good. Uh, China is a friendly country, uh, would be something the whole world would like to see. Uh, but just by making that judgment by receiving the donation of the masks, that perhaps is a little bit short-sighted. Well, I think, uh, the, for the Italian uh, government and the people, they must uh, remember that uh, it, Italy reported their first COVID-19 case on the 31st of January. It was actually two Chinese tourists in Rome that were reported as having the COVID-19. Uh, they left uh, this uh, Wuhan one day before the city was locked down, but somehow, uh, you know, uh, on the journey of the uh, European trip in uh, Italy, in Rome, they were found uh, and tested positive. Uh, we we hope that uh, we need actually an international uh, cooperation to face the the post COVID nineteen era, and then uh, if China is willing to do more good. And then they are more than welcome to do that. And we want to be part of that too. And uh, because this has to be a concerted effort that includes everyone. As uh, Mr. Burico said, that a full inclusion of Taiwan has to be uh, considered. And it, it doesn't need to rock the boat. And um, Taiwan is very pragmatic, even until today. We are only asking to be an observer. Uh, we are not. Uh, if we want to make it a political issue, we can ask for being a member, but we are only asking for, uh, and more importantly, we need a channel for us to to offer our assistance. Thank you, Ambassador. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, so we have to wrap up. There have been uh, more questions, most of them directed to Utah and Marcel. So I would say to those uh, participants, uh, one of them uh, seems to be a, a journalist from Taiwan. They can easily contact us directly. Also, uh, listeners that want to be in touch with us and hear our opinion can be in touch with us directly. I would just shortly say I thank you very much, Dr. Tsung, for doing this with us. I think you have been very informative. You have given people the opportunity to understand better the situation uh, as it has evolved in Taiwan. So thanks very much. Yuta, over to you. Yes, for me too. Thank you so much. We feel really honored that you took that time and um, took up your gave a very lively report of how things um, developed in Taiwan and how well you were able to suppress actually the, the outbreak of the virus which has brought havoc to a lot of countries and Taiwan was spared and I think that's something that you can really be proud of, of being so vigilant and um, acting so quickly because I had a I had another um, phone call with someone today and we were talking about crisis and we, we came to the same conclusion in a crisis time is your enemy the longer you hesitate the longer you linger the the more likely it is that the crisis will unfold and will become worse. And I think that's the, the crucial point where Taiwan um, has shown us how to act in a crisis. And again, from me, thank you very much for being with us. We wish you the best of everything, of course, health, continued health. And hopefully that we can meet in person someday when um, 
this pandemic um, is one for the history books. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for hosting this event. Thank you. Thanks to all the participants. Have a good evening. And thanks to the technical staff for organizing. Thank you.